We have been experiencing God's presence here at Grants Mill. Can I get an amen? And that video just fired me up. I know that's been happening at every other campus because there is so much negative news in the world and there's, it's all around us. But come on, God is still moving. Jesus is alive and there is hope for this generation. There's hope for you and you are in the right place tonight. We are in the right place tonight because God's presence is here. And I'm just, I'm so thankful for our God. Even as we head into these next couple of weeks with Palm Sunday and Easter, and as we reflect on the cross, but come on somebody, we celebrate the empty tomb and the resurrected God and the power of the Holy Spirit, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. And that's what we're here tonight for, to recognize that. Come on, I'm fired up. It's a good night. And I'm excited for where we are as a church. And I uh, just want you guys to know that it's gonna be a really special next couple of weeks. You know, we said this back in January, PC really started the, the entire year out by telling us we have, we believe, we have faith, this is gonna be a year of great faith. And I'm just happy to report that's exactly what we're seeing at every campus, every location, just incredible attendance, salvations. And we feel like it's really just been building up to these next couple of weeks. And PC is back this Sunday to preach on Palm Sunday. And then come on somebody, the next week it's Easter. And I don't know who you're inviting, but my wife and I, we're praying for who we're inviting. We're believe the lost are gonna get saved. We're gonna see miracles happen. And just all, all to all glory to God. Um, because I believe like never before we and, and the world needs God, and we have the opportunity to show them how amazing Jesus is. And so just really excited about all that and excited for, about what God is doing in our church. Really love that video and seeing what God's doing in this next generation. You know, I'm a product of that. I'm so thankful for our church and our pastor. I, I was just reflecting. I was 19 years old when I came to Church of the Highlands and I've been here now 21 years and just all that God has done in my life. I'm so grateful for this place. And I'm grateful that our pastor believes in this next generation. If you've been around Highlands the last month, that's what you've been hearing. It's just his heart for this next generation, for, for leaders especially. For, we see a leader in every one of these students. That they can be a leader in their generation. And last first Wednesday, we heard from Pastor Bubba Massey. If you were here, come on somebody, it was an amazing night. He leads our college students, our Tuscaloosa campus pastor who also leads our college students. And tonight, PC has made room for another young leader who's a, who's a key part, a new part in fact, a key part of our, our student team. And tonight you're gonna hear from Pastor Leighton German, who you may or may not know, but you're gonna love him after tonight. And Pastor Leighton and his wife, Hannah, joined our team a little over a year ago, uh, but they are not new here at Highlands. He's a 2012 Highlands College graduate. And that fires me up. And God called him down to, the, to Florida, Jacksonville, Florida where he was a youth pastor for years and also helped launch one of their campuses. And as much as you learn from that, we know God really called him down there to find his amazing wife, Hannah. And now, now I'm so glad they are back here. They're back home here at Highlands. And Leighton has stepped into our student team um, to help in every area, but especially to lead our student pastors at every location. And Leighton, I just want you to know, before you even come up on this platform tonight, I love you. I am so proud of you. I'll never forget meeting you years ago and see how you have continued to pursue God in the tough times and in the good times. And you are a product truly of our dream, all of our dream for Highlands College and for the next generation. You're a living proof that God is alive and he's moving. Come on Highlands, stand to your feet and welcome Pastor Layton German as he comes to preach the word of God. Clapping. Why don't you give it up for King Jesus? Come on at every campus. Come on, give him two seconds of your best praise. Man, it is good to be at First Wednesday. You can go ahead and take your seat. Take your seat. Tell your neighbor they look good tonight. I hope it's your spouse you're sitting next to. If not, it's going to be awkward. Man, it's so good to be here at First Wednesday. Um, and, and man, honored to be a part of this moment. Like Pastor Mark said, uh, you know, I'm a product of Highlands College, and if I haven't had the privilege to meet you, I uh, get to serve on our student team, which I think is the best team. Come on, student team, best team. So honored to, to be here tonight, honored to be a part of this church, to be a part of this moment. And um, I just want to say across to every single campus and everyone watching online, uh, we're a part of something special. It's really special, the house that we're a part of. And I, I, I um, remember 12 years walking into this house. You know, I came to Alabama on a whim. I saw 24 seven with Pastor Lane. It was a video of Pastor Lane online at 2 a.m. And I'm like, hey, I'm just gonna go to Alabama. And I thought I was coming to cornfields and flat land and I came to Birmingham. I'm like, this is amazing. This is really pretty. 
And 12 years later, what I could tell you about what this church means to me, and I'm a crier, so just bear with me. For 21 years, I knew what it was like to be a member of a church. But for the past 12 years, I've learned what, it's look like, what it looks like to be a son. And there's nothing like being loved at your worst and being loved at your best. And the reason we have this house is our senior pastor. The Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul tells us about leaders in the church, and he says there's many teachers in the church, but there's few fathers. And our house is special because of people like you who invest in people like me, and because we have a senior pastor who believes in a vision bigger than himself. And so I just want to thank you as a church. Come on, give yourself a hand for all that you believe in, all that you invest in, every single campus, every dollar you've given, every ounce you've served, every time you've given up. Thank, I'm a product of your generosity, and we have an incredible senior pastor. Come on, let's give it up for our senior pastor, Pastor Chris. Pastor Chris, if you have your Bible, you ready to dive in? You have your Bible? Come on, who brought their paper Bible? You have your Bible? Turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 4, 2 Kings chapter 4. While you're turning there, I, I do want to remind us that, man, we're in this season fighting for this next generation. If you've missed the, the past two months of the conversation, I don't think there's been a more clear picture of Pastor Chris being a spiritual father than the way he's fought for this generation. And we've gone on a journey asking questions, asking parents, asking students, asking leaders, what is it that we should do as a team to better serve this generation? And if you missed that conversation, I just want to remind you of what we've discovered on the journey. And the, the generation that we're in right now, I think we think in our mind it wants less of us, right? They want less church. They want less God. But what we've discovered is they want more of this. And Pastor Chris shared it with us that this generation wants us to fight for them. They want us to fight. This generation is not a danger we hide from. It's an opportunity we fight for. We fight with all that we have. Someone fought for us, and I think it's time to fight for them. And I'm excited to announce that tonight is the beginning of that fight. Tonight, we are launching a new model here at Church of the Highlands within our student ministry. You didn't know you were just coming to, you thought you were coming just to a normal first Wednesday, but this isn't a normal first Wednesday. This is the beginning of the future. This is the beginning of our fight. And here, let me just break it down, because every vision needs a strategy, a vehicle to carry that out. And the vehicle, the strategy behind our model moving forward is we're going to launch weekly services across all of our campuses. Weekly services. Come on, students. You love that. So weekly gatherings every single Wednesday night. And I want to break it down for you. So what these Wednesday nights will look like on the first Wednesday you're here at First Wednesday. Our students will have an opportunity to connect before and after service. But they're going to get to attend this service and be in the presence of God with us. And I'm so excited for that family service we have as a church. On the second Wednesday of the month, everybody say motion night. Motion. We're going to continue motion night. And Motion Night will be hosted across eight regional hosts all over the state and in Columbus. And let me give you some vision for Motion Night. Motion Night exists to reach lost people. It exists to see lost students saved. And this generation, what we've learned about this generation, it's, it's not entertainment that brings about salvation. It's encounter. And so Motion Night, what we're going to do is we're going to get students in the presence of God and give them something here they cannot find in the world. So parents, we need your help. Get them in the room. Get them in the presence of God. Fight for them. Even if they don't want to be here, I'll bribe them. Hey, steak and shake is amazing. I'll get it. I promise you milkshakes on me. Every campus, if you need it, just call me. My number is, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Motion night, the second Wednesday, third, fourth, and fifth Wednesday, which is a new development in our ministry, is going to be called Motion Midweek, and I'm so excited for that. It's going to be local at every single campus, led by the student pastor, an intentional environment for students to be discipled and connected relationally, because what we know is they need people fighting for them consistently. It's not what we do occasionally that shows them our fight. It's what we do consistently, and I'm excited for this future, and I just happen to believe, I don't know about you, I just happen to believe that the best days are still ahead, right? that there's more for this generation. I see revival sweeping through. I've been wrestling with this statement. People are calling this generation the great departure, but I think they're the great return, and they're going to bring about revival in this generation and this land all over the world. Come on, if you believe that, why don't you give them a shout of praise? All right, I'm done screaming at you about this next generation. As you can tell, I'm excited. 
And uh, let's turn to 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4. We find ourselves with a story of a Shunammite woman. In verse 20, if you're in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 20, it says, After the servant had lifted him up and carried him to his mother, the boy sat on her lap until noon, and he died. Context to this verse, there's a Shunammite woman who's really hospitable to the prophet Elisha. And Elisha has this idea, this woman doesn't have a son, let me promise her a son. So he promises her a son, and the Bible says, a year after the promise, she bore a son. And the son grows old, oh, there's a table there, hey, how you doing? I'm gonna trip over this. If you guys don't know this, I'm not like PC, I won't stand right in front of the camera, I'm gonna run around like a rabbit on uh, espresso. Is that a thing? I don't think it's a thing. This son grows up and one day he's in the field working with his dad, doing what every good son does, work. And he says, my head hurts. And after his head hurts, the dad does what any good dad does. He brings him to the mom. Go to your mom, son. And the Bible says he's laying on the lap of his mom and he dies. In verse 21, it says, she went up and she laid him on the bed of the man of God, and then she shut the door and she went out, and she told her husband, send me a servant and a donkey, because I'm going back to the man of God. He says, why are you going today? Is it the new moon or the Sabbath? And she says, it's fine. So she saddled the donkey, and she said to her servant, lead on and don't slow down until I get there. So she set out for the man of God, and when Elisha sees her at a distance, the man of God said to the servant, look. It's a Shunammite woman. Ask her, how's your husband? How, how are your kids? How are you doing? And she responds to Gehazi, I'm good. Everything's fine. And then the Bible says she reaches the man of God in verse 27, and she takes hold of his feet. And Gehazi came to push her away, but the man of God said, no, leave her alone. Obviously, the Lord has hidden something from me, and he has not told me why. And she comes up, and I imagine this Shunammite woman is a little sassy like Medea. She's like, did I not tell you to don't play? Like, don't get my, I've asked for a son before. Did I not tell you to get my hopes up? And here I am, I have a dying son that died in my lap, and I'm back asking you about what happened to the promise. And the Bible says that Elisha sends Gehazi ahead to heal the son, and she's like, no, no, no. As surely as the Lord lives, and as surely as you live, I'm not leaving without you. I, I need you. So tonight I want to talk to you from a message entitled, The Response of Faith. That faith has a response. Why don't you pray with me? Lord, we love you. We thank you for who you are. Lord, we thank you that, that faith begins in you. You're the author and perfecter of our faith. And God, we fix our eyes on you right now. We, we ask you to speak to us, to, to open up our ears, to, to hear your voice, to open up the eyes of our heart, to see you more clearly than we ever have before. Lord, we just thank you that we won't just be hearers of the word, but tonight, God, we will put it into practice. Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit that guides and comforts and leads in Jesus' name. Amen. I have a question by a show of hands. How many of you, you've ever been given something that once you got it, you're like, I don't know what to do with this? You're like, I, my wife would tell you that anytime I'm given a tool to build or fix, that's me. My family says I'm about as, cap, as handy as Captain Hook. I can't build anything. Can't build Legos. Well, about 10 years ago, um, I was living in Jacksonville, Florida, like Pastor Mark says, and I love the Pettises so much. I was living in Jacksonville, Florida, and my, my younger brother was living with me. I was a youth pastor. He was in art school, and my brother, um, while he was in school, he was valeting cars. And my brother and I, we love golf. Shout out to my brother who's watching today. We, we love golf. And one day before work, we decided to go play golf. And he gathered his clothes before work and we go play golf. And it was a, a, an abnormally cold and rainy, wet day in Jacksonville. And after the round, my brother goes to work. And when he gets to work, he realizes he has a problem. He's a big problem. And the problem that he has is when he grabbed his clothes for work, he forgot to grab an extra pair of shoes and an extra pair of socks. So it's a muddy golf day in Jacksonville, and now my brother is about to valet cars with brown socks and golf shoes. The second problem he had was a, a much bigger problem. Um, my brother is 6'4". He's a tall guy. We had a roommate who worked in the same valet company who was 5'6 on a good day. On stilts, he was 5'6". And when my brother grabbed his work pants, he didn't grab his pants. 
he grabbed my roommate's pants. And so here is my brother, long hair looking like Sean White the snowboarder, about to valet cars with pants maybe down past his knees. I don't even know if they counted as capris. They were just long shorts. <laughs> pants barely past his knees, white dirty socks, golf shoes, a massive parka jacket, and a beanie. And he's about to valet cars. And when he's valeting the car, there was this sweet, hospitable couple who walks up to him and they're like, hey, um, do you need anything? Are you okay? And he's like, yeah, why? Like, what's the problem? Well, a couple hours later, that same couple, the generous couple who, who loved to check on him, came back. And when they came back, they proceeded to bring him a box. And he was valeting at this fine dining Italian restaurant in Jacksonville. And they bring him a box of pizza when they leave the restaurant. And now this wasn't only uh, just a box of pizza, this was their leftover pizza from their meal. And they're like, sir, I just thought you could use this. God bless you, hope you have a great night. And he's like, what? Why, why have you given me this? And I remember asking him, like, what did you do? How did you respond? He's like, how do you think I responded? I ate the pizza, it was an amazing pizza. <laughs> And I remember hearing that story from my brother and his response to the situation was, I don't know what to do with this. He didn't know how to respond to a random person giving him a box of pizza. And I think as funny as that story is about not knowing how to respond, I would imagine my brother's not the only person in life who's been given something that they don't know how to respond to. Maybe there's a doctor report that you got. You're like, what do I do with this? Maybe there's a family loss where you're like, I I've been given this, this situation, and now, God, what, what do I do with this? There there's a marital problem. There's a son who's gone wayward. There's a, a job loss. There's things that come our way, and we're like, I don't know how to respond to that. And I love this story in 2 Kings chapter 4 because you see a picture that sometimes you cannot control what comes to you, but you can control how you respond. See, 2 Kings chapter 4, it shows us a picture of faith, and I think when we think of this word faith, we're, we're in a, a year of great, faith. come on, every camp is great, faith. we're in a year of great faith, and the trap, is the, the, the trap is that when we think of great faith, we think that faith eliminates the problems. It rids us of the bad. It only brings blessings. It only brings good things. And, and God, he's the God who gives everything that is good. But, but we're in this world, this carnal world, and sometimes things come our way and we're like, I don't know what to do with this. And 2 Kings chapter 4 teaches us a little about faith that I want to teach you about tonight. So here's what we learned from the Shunammite woman. The big premise of this message is that faith does not assure us of a life without problems. I need you to hear that. Faith is not gonna promise you that you'll have life without problems, but faith will always allow you a response. It'll always give you a choice. I cannot control what comes my way, but I can control what I do with it. Faith does not assure a life without situations that you're like, this is too big for me. But I'm here to tell you, church, it allows you a response. Faith allowed four friends to carry their paralytic friend to Jesus. It allowed them to do that and he received healing. Faith allowed a woman who had a 12-year bleeding problem to crawl through a crowd she, was, she wasn't supposed to be in because she's unclean. Faith allowed that. She presses through a crowd. She reaches. She doesn't even touch Jesus. She touches the, head, the hem of his garment, and she's healed. Faith allowed that. Faith allowed two blind men who could not see Jesus, but they heard him, to cry out for mercy and receive healing. And I think you see in this story that faith allows this woman to respond different than anyone else. And I'm here to tell you, I don't know what you're carrying. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know if you've been given a random pizza box in Jacksonville, Florida. You're like, what do I do with this? I'm here to tell you that you have a response. Second Kings chapter four teaches us four things we see in the response of faith from this Shunammite woman. First thing you see in the story of the Shunammite woman is that faith, faith will cause a determined pursuit. It'll cause a determined pursuit. Look at this story in 2 Kings chapter 4. The son dies. The servant had lifted him up to the mother. The, the son dies on her lap. And then it says, she went up. She laid him on the bed of the man of God. She shut the door. She called her husband. And she says, I'm determined to get back to Elisha. Notice where she goes in this story. She doesn't run to her husband to solve the problem. Faith did not cause her to respond to social media. Faith did not cause her to run to another promise. Faith caused her to run back to the promiser. 
And you need to know, anytime a promise doesn't look like what you thought it would look like, the best place to go, the best place to be determined in your pursuit is to go back to the promiser. And she's determined, I gotta get back to Elisha. I gotta go to him. But I love that it's not just where she goes when she responds, it's when she goes. She wasn't only determined to get to Elisha, she was determined to go there first. See, what separates this woman and other stories in the Bible, there's a story uh, of the woman with the issue of blood. I just shared it earlier. That story in Luke 8 says that after she spent all she had, then she goes. But I love that this story in 2 Kings says she went first. She was determined to go first. She understand the importance of order. And I think we are a church that gets that. What prayer is our first response. It's not our last resort. It's the first thing we do. We're here at First Wednesday. I'm speaking to people who are at First Wednesday who drove through a storm. You get the value of first. Matthew 6, 33 says what? We seek first. We're determined to go first. I love that Jesus, when he's teaching the story in Matthew 6, he doesn't tell us to seek the kingdom and then go first. He says, seek first. Seek when and then seek where. Seek first. Why is it important to be determined in where you go first? I think it's important to know that because what you go to first often reveals what you trust most. Where you go first is a big picture of where you really have your hope and your trust. In a year of great faith, great faith will cause me to be determined to get back to the promiser. And any time I have a situation that doesn't look like what I thought it would look like, I can go to Jesus. The first thing you see is a determined pursuit. The second thing you see that faith caused this woman to do was a disciplined posture. You see a disciplined posture as soon as she starts heading to Elisha, her husband asked her in verse 23, why go to him today? Is it the new moon? Is it Sabbath? And she responds, it's all right. Then she gets to Elisha and her, his servant stops her head. He's like, oh, hey, how's, how, how's everyone doing? How's the kid? How's the husband? How's the house? Are you, you drinking Starbucks still? Like, what's your favorite drink right now? And she responds, it's fine. How many husbands know when they say it's fine? It's not fine. It's 911. It's code red. <laughs> Call the doctor. Call somebody because it's fine. And if you don't know that, hey, just let me give you some marital advice. When they say it's fine, please take her to brunch the next morning. Do something. But the translation of it's okay and it's fine is a really, really bad translation of what's happening here in the story. Because the Bible in Hebrew here is not translating that it is fine or I'm okay. She actually responds to the two times she's asked, what do you do with this situation? How are you doing? She responds it as well. And the word well that she says in Hebrew is the word shalom. What I love about this word shalom is shalom is never speaking to the external. The word shalom could be defined as an inward wholeness. And she teaches us that I'm so disciplined in my posture that it does not have to be well with my situation for it to be well with my soul. I'm so disciplined that it doesn't have to be good everywhere else, but it can be good in me. I mean, isn't that the story of Paul? That I'm perplexed, yet. I'm sorrowful, yet. I'm I'm pressed down, yet. He teaches us the story that, hey, it doesn't have to be well with your situation. It doesn't have to be well with your family. It doesn't have to be well with your job. It doesn't have to be well with with your, it, it just needs to be well right here. It's well. I remember a couple years ago, my wife and I, uh, have you ever felt like you had your life flipped upside down? I told you I'm a crier. I remember a couple years ago, got a phone call and life was changing. And the city we made home was changing and the job we called home was changing and the people we called home was changing. I remember, if I can be honest, I remember being kind of frustrated, kind of mad, like, why is this happening to me? It was out of obedience that came suffering. And I remember not only being mad at people, but mad at God, like, why? And I remember this moment where I was reminded 
that my posture was out of alignment. Why is that? Because my posture was hinging on what happened to me. And I was so focused on the external, but there was no shalom inward peace. And life was crazy, and, and job was crazy, and there was a lot of pain, and there was a lot of disappointment, and there was a lot of frustration, and there was a lot of what's next. But I'm here to tell you, you don't have to know what's happening around for you to know what's happening within. And too often, we think posture is a result of what happens to you, but I need you to know, posture is a result of what happens in you. I get to control that. I get to dictate that. I cannot choose my storm, but I always choose my spirit. Winds and waves come. Weather comes. I mean, we're here in Alabama, and we know that stuff's coming our way, but I'm just here to tell you, man, your circumstance isn't worth your joy. It's not worth your peace. It's not worth your patience. It's not worth your calling. There's too much at stake for the enemy to bring winds and for you to let it take you. Posture is a result of what happens in me. And I did a couple things two years ago when my posture was out of alignment that I just want to give you practical steps of what can you do? If you feel like my posture is not disciplined, can I just help you? Because faith always has a response. And here was my first response to being out of alignment. It was guarding my heart. I love what Pastor Bubba taught last week, that your heart is worth the work. And I had to guard my heart. David in Psalm 119 says that I incline my heart. As if to say, your heart's normal default is declined, and I have power to set it up. I incline my heart. Some of you today, I'm sorry that life's been hard. And here's what posture does not say. Posture does not say what's happening to you is right. It doesn't say the pain's not real. It doesn't negate what you're walking through, but it does just say, hey, there's a better response. It's not worth you. Guard your heart. Second thing I did was I knew my home. I love what Pastor Chris shared two weeks ago. When earth gets hard, focus on heaven. And he said this statement that I'll forever remember, that if I'm in Christ, if I now have faith because of Jesus, earth is the closest thing to hell that I'll ever experience. And when I can fix my eyes on Jesus and I can know that heaven is my home, it really changes my posture. And I had this statement come to, to me two years ago, and I just want to say to you, here's what I came out of a situation that honestly was really hard to walk through. Here's what God spoke to me that helped me say discipline in my posture. And he reminded me that earth is my home and heaven is, uh, uh, sorry, heaven is my home, excuse me. <laughs> heaven is my home, earth is my opportunity. What does the Bible say we're citizens of? We're citizens of heaven. What does the Bible say we're ambassadors in? Earth. My home is with Christ. Where I'm sent to make a difference is here on earth. Heaven's my home. Jesus is my focus. Eternity. And I may never experience all that God has for, for me on this side of heaven, but I do know there is a home where there's no weeping, where there's no pain, where there's no gnashing. And if heaven is my home, this is the closest thing I'll ever experience to hell. And my posture can be disciplined. Number three, the third thing you see in this story. Number one, you see a determined pursuit. Faith will cause a determined pursuit. Number two, you'll see a disciplined posture. Number three you'll see a desperate cling. In verse 27, she gets to Elisha, and what does she do? She falls to his feet, and she grabs his heel. And then Elisha's servant, Gehazi, tries to push her off, and he's like, no, 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 don't do this. She, she's really mad right now. She's kind of sassy. Please don't do this. I promise you, it's not fine, okay? And then she tells Elisha, hey, I know you're trying to send someone else ahead, but as surely as the Lord lives, surely as you live and I live, I'm not leaving without you. Yeah. Yeah. And I love this moment because she has an asking for the manager moment. <laughs> Come on, everybody has a family member who asks for the manager. You're like, mom, not again. It's just a piece of hair. <laughs> She's like, can I speak to your supervisor, please? Random question, why is it that we all turn into eight Enneagrams when we ask for the supervisor? <laughs> we're like so direct, so rude, so rash, brash, we're like. And she says, no, 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 Elisha, I, I'm so thankful Gehazi is a part of this process, but I need you. And why is it that we ask for a manager when we ask for a manager? 
Because we're asking for someone who has the power to change it to step in. And she says, Elijah, I'm all, I love Gehazi. So thankful for him. His favorite drink is a caramel macchiato. I love him. I know him well. But you gave me this promise. And you're the only one who can fix it. So for you tonight, what do you need to cling to? She walked up to a physical prophet and held on to his heels. And I'm not leaving unless this thing changes. But for you, you don't have Elisha standing in your bedroom. But what you do have is the word and the promise of God. And it is yes and amen in Jesus. And no matter what situation you have, you can cling to peace. You can cling to hope. You can cling to whatever it is that you need. So tonight, here's what I wanted you to do. I I would imagine that some of you walked in not holding tightly and desperately clinging. So I want to give you something to cling to tonight. If you need peace, you need to remember John 14 says that peace I leave you, peace I give you. Cling. And I don't give it like the world gives it. And I love what he says here. Discipline your posture. Don't let your hearts be troubled. If you need wisdom... The Bible says in James, if anyone lacks wisdom, just ask. And God generously gives. If you need comfort, Psalm 46 says that God is our refuge and our strength, and he is an ever-present help in trouble. If you need provision, Philippians 4 says that my God will supply every, all. And I just wanted to encourage someone today who needs provision, do not underestimate your source and overestimate your scarcity. You have a God that will supply all. He's the God of all comfort. He's the God of peace. He's the God of provision, and he can supply. Cling. Cling that the Bible in 2 Corinthians reminds us that all of the promises of God are yes and amen. And I don't know what promise you need, but you know the answer? Yeah. Amen. You need peace? Yes. And amen. Jesus is telling you it's available, so cling to it tonight. The last thing you see in the story, band can join me. You know it sounds more spiritual when they're building behind me. Come on, it's so good when they're here. You also know this is like my third close. Hey, I'm closing for the third time. The fourth thing you see in this story, there was a a determined pursuit. There was a a desperate, uh, there, there was a disciplined posture. There was a desperate cling. And number four, there was a deliberate placement. Now, I need to give you context here. When Elisha gets to the house, he comes to the house, and he's trying to heal this son. And verse 32 says, when he reached the house, there was a boy lying on his couch. He's like, hold up, why is this dude on my couch? Well, actually, the first thing the woman did before she went to Elisha, it says the boy dies on her lap in verse 20. And then in verse 21, it says that she went and she laid him on the bed of the man of God. Now, why would this woman not lay this son on his car bed with strong lights hung over it. Why did she lay him in the prophet's room? Why would she do that? Do you think it was just in the closest room to her? No, this was a symbol and a declaration of what this woman is doing here. Instead of putting him in his room, she put him in the prophet's room because it was a symbol that the situation isn't over. And scholars would tell you that when you put something in a prophet's room, you were declaring and you were preparing for a resurrection not a burial and here we have this woman she lays the son in the prophet's room and she says it's not over I'm not preparing for a burial I'm not pouring dirt on this I'm not buying a casket I'm not believing for it I'm not asking for it I believe that God still has a resurrection power and Elisha you gave it so come bring it back to life isn't this what we're celebrating in two weeks that Jesus when he died he didn't prepare for a burial He said, Joseph, I need your tomb because I'm coming back to life and the tomb's going to be empty and resurrection is my destination. So here's what I want to just ask some of you tonight. What have you buried too early? I felt like there were some people in the room in prayer today and you have misplaced problems. And the right thing to do would be to put that problem where you think it deserves. But what faith would tell you to do is that there's another room and that door has not closed and Jesus has not closed shop on miracles. He hasn't shut the door on resurrection. He hasn't shut the door on mercy. Provision is still available. Hope is still available. Your future has, you have a bright future. And I'm here to just ask you, 
where are you placing your problems? Because faith has a response. And it's not the response the world tells you. The world would tell you to put your problem in the boys' room. But Jesus is saying, hey, I knock at the door. Come, bring it to me. I don't just do resurrection. I am resurrection. I am the life. And I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if it worked for this boy, if it worked for me, it can still work for you. I can pick up dead dreams. I can pick up dead marriages. I can pick up dead purpose. Resurrection is who I am. And I cannot promise you that everything's going to change. But I can promise you he is still the same. Faith does not promise a life without problems, but it does promise that you'll always have a response. So why don't you stand to your feet with me? At every campus, every person on watching watching online, I want to ask a question. How should you respond tonight? If there's something you need to cling to, is there a posture you need to take? Is there a pursuit you need to have? Do you need to put your problems in the right place? And remember, with God, thing, with God, all things are possible. But if you keep putting it in the room of man, it's going to stay dead. But if you bring it to Jesus, he can lift up anything. He can flatten any mountain. He can lift any valley. He can make every crooked road straight. So let's respond in faith. Faith doesn't promise that I'm not going to walk through difficulty, but it does promise I always have a response. So I just want to know who I'm praying for. If you need to respond tonight, I just want you to lift your hands. I'm not going to ask for heads to be bowed, for for eyes to be closed. I'm just going to pray because faith sometimes needs to do it in public. The woman with the issue of blood didn't wait for everyone to leave the crowd. She went right through and said, I need Jesus. I need to step through this situation. Even though I'm not supposed to be here, I'm going to keep pressing on. I'm going to keep moving forward. Come on, let's pray. Lord, we love you. Come on, right now, just extend your heart. Just extend your problem. Right now, Lord, we, we give We give you the situations, we give you the burdens, we give you the cares, and God, we know right now that you still work, you still move, you still work all things together for the good, so Lord, right now, we ask you for things to come back to life, for you to move, for you to pick up dead situations, come on, if you believe that, 